Welcome to the Tabernacle Part 3. In this part, we'll be dealing with the coverings and the holy place. This is the actual building itself. By way of quick review, we had talked about the outside with the white fence that surrounded the courtyard and the tabernacle. And we said that it was uh, represented the righteousness of God. And um, there was only one entrance into the courtyard. And we talked about that one entrance represented Christ. Then we went through the one gate that represents Christ. And we saw the two items in the outer court. The first one was the brazen altar, which represents suffering and uh, death. For Christ, it represented his dying on the cross and suffering. For the believer, it represented uh, giving up our life. And then the brazen laver, which represented washing. And we had talked about baptism. So we had studied that in the previous lessons. We're now going to move on to go right into the tabernacle itself. First, the coverings. Now this is the actual building without the curtains on it. It was made of wood and all of the wood was overlaid with gold and then the foundation, if you will, was silver. There was no floor. The dirt ground was the floor. We are now going to look at... Um, now this one room here actually gets divided when they put the curtain in there. That curtain that they put in there divides the two rooms. We'll see this later on. And that curtain is called a veil. It's very important. We're going to go into all of this later on. But basically, it's just a shell. And right now, we're going to deal with the coverings. There were four different coverings on this tabernacle. And each one of them represented something very important that we have to go into here to study. We will start with the innermost layer, the actual ceiling of the inside of the tabernacle. Of all four layers, it was four different layers for the roof. Of all four layers, this inner layer was the most beautiful. We really don't know exactly what it looked like, and many artists portray it different ways. But it was fine linen with the same four colors of white, blue, purple, and scarlet. Many portray this as being white with the needlework of embroidery of the three colors of blue, purple, and scarlet. However, God did instruct Moses to make this layer with cherubims of cunning work. There are some differences among scholars as to what these cherubims really are, represent. That is whether they are certain types of angels or are they representative of the Holy Spirit, such as the dove representing the Holy Spirit when Jesus got baptized. We know that they had wings. This layer was actually 10 curtains all joined together as one curtain with 50 loops of blue and 50 clasps of gold. So the ceiling of this tabernacle, as the priest looked up, was just one sky of beautiful color of cherubims with the wings spread over the entire ceiling. It typified the beauty of holiness and also the scripture in Psalm 63, 7, where it states, In the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. And again in Psalms 91, 4, Under his wings thou shalt trust. The Bible also contains the dimensions of these curtains and there is significance to the numbers, but we will not get too deep for the sake of time. However, the number of loops being 50 does have significance worth mentioning. 50 is the number of freedom, liberty, and jubilee. The word Pentecost means 50, and the church was started on the day of Pentecost. So for the church, the significance is this. Those in the church are free from the slavery of sin through Jesus Christ. The church experiences the baptism of the Holy Spirit and rejoices in this jubilee. So that's the significance and almost like the prophecy of the church right in the tabernacle there. Now, as I said, there were four layers of coverings here. Now we're going to deal with the second one. The second layer from the inside was a layer of goats here, and it was probably um, black since most goats in this region were black. This too was composed of curtains coupled together in strips totaling 11 instead of 10 like it was with the first layer with 50 loops of blue. However, the tatches this time were of brass, not gold. Some say that the number 11 represents lawlessness and disorder. One thing is for sure, the scriptures do indicate by the offerings in the Law of Moses that the goat is a symbol of sin and was used for the sin offering. I can't help but wonder if that's why most 
Satanists used a pentagram which they show as the goat's head as one of their symbols. Even though the goat represents sin in the Bible, this layer of goat's hair typified Christ because the Bible teaches that Jesus was made sin for us. He bore our sins. He took our sins on himself and of course bore the penalty or the judgment or the wrath of God. The idea of the scapegoat which really came from the law of Moses during a special day with a special goat sacrifice was that of transferring our sins on the goat or their sins on the goat which was then led out of the camp representing uh, their sins being put on another and carried away from them. Yes, on that day in Jerusalem, our sins were put on Jesus Christ, who was led out of Jerusalem carrying his cross along with our sins. How fitting that the tatches were of bronze this time, because bronze, or brass, it's called brass in the Bible, represented judgment, and sin must always be judged. The next layer was a layer of ram's skins dyed red. The ram in the Bible was always used as a substitute. Remember one of the most striking events in the Old Testament with regards to the sacrifices was when Abraham was asked to offer up his only son Isaac on the altar. When God stopped Abraham, Abraham offered the ram instead of his son. It was a substitute. The red dye speaks of the blood Christ would shed for our sins when he took our place and died in our stead and became our substitute. This last layer, uh, the biblical name for it was badger's skins, but it was not the badgers that we know here in the Western world. Such animals were not found in the Middle East. Rather, the animal was most likely a porpoise or some type of marine animal. This was a layer of protection from the harmful elements of the sun, the rain, the dust, it represents how Christ shields us from the judgment of God's wrath by bearing the judgment himself. He took the pounding of the elements and protected all those inside him. The appearance of this layer is also significant. Only this outer layer of covering was visible to the public and there was nothing beautiful about it. Likewise, Jesus' appearance did not look like anything special. In Isaiah 53, 2, we read, quote, He hath no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him." Unquote. To the natural and unregenerate man, there is nothing attractive about Christ. In other words, anyone outside of Christ does not see anything beautiful about Christ. Only those in Christ will see the inner layer of the tabernacle ceiling, the beauty of holiness. There are many other elaborations and points that can be made because the Word of God is rich with many of these elaborations and explanations. Further study will bring much more of these great gems of truth out and give God more glory that he rightly deserves. The more we study, the more beauty, wisdom, and greatness we see in our God. Let us therefore move on to the tabernacle building itself on the inside. Okay, here I just want to give you a, a rough framework and then we're going to let the video play so you can see how it was constructed. But you see the framework there, it was wood, and all the wood planks were overlaid with gold. But there's that curtain that I told you about, the veil. There's the one um, door to get into the tabernacle. And uh, that curtain, there's a top view, okay? There's two main curtains, the door, which is the front, and that makes you come into the holy place, the first room that's a rectangle. Then there's that veil, and that separates the smaller square room there. That's the most holy place. Well, that veil, we're going to learn all about that, but that veil is very significant. Only the priests were allowed in the holy place, and only the high priest was allowed in the most holy place. Um, so you can see it, it's just one um, room, but it's divided by these curtains. All right. So now we're going to see how it was constructed, and I'm going to let you listen to the video. The framework of the tabernacle will consist of frames made of acacia wood. Each frame must be 15 feet high and two and a quarter feet wide. There will be two pegs on each frame so they can be joined to the next frame. All the frames must be made this way. Twenty of these frames will support the south side of the tabernacle. They will fit into 40 silver bases, two bases under each frame. On the north side there will also be 20 of these frames with their 40 silver bases, 
two bases for each frame. On the west side there will be six frames, along with an extra frame at each corner. These corner frames will be connected at the bottom and firmly attached at the top with a single ring forming a single unit. Both of these corner frames will be made the same way. So there will be eight frames on that end of the tabernacle supported by 16 silver bases, two bases under each frame. Make crossbars of acacia wood to run across the frames. Five crossbars for the north side of the tabernacle and five for the south side. Also make five crossbars for the rear of the tabernacle which will face westward. The middle crossbar, halfway up the frames, will run all the way from one end of the tabernacle to the other. Overlay the frames with gold and make gold rings to support the crossbars. Overlay the crossbars with gold as well. Set up this tabernacle according to the design you were shown on the mountain. Okay, we're going to talk about this tabernacle a little bit more now. First, the overview. Um, I took the top off and we're looking at this thing from the sky down into it and you will notice of course there's two curtains there the one at the bottom of your screen that's the door the priests would walk into that room from the outer court into the door which is the first curtain at the bottom of your screen in that first room called the holy place it's 30 feet long by 15 feet wide by 15 feet high and then there's that second curtain and that's the veil and then beyond that there's the smaller room there that's called the most holy place and only the high priest can go in that second room the most holy place and he can only go there once a year but although there are items in these rooms the one thing that there is not in these rooms is chairs the priest nor the high priest was never to sit down okay this is the holy place the bigger room the priests were allowed in here there was three items in this room we're going to go into them in detail the artists of course just, um, portray them different ways we're going to see a video that shows them differently than you see here but we're going to learn what they mean that's the most important part now here's another picture another artist that depicted the holy place um, well, I want to draw your attention to two things number one in the on the side it's almost on the right side of the picture it's in the back of the holy place the back of the room there you'll see that veil that's portrayed quite differently than you saw in the last picture obviously um, but nobody knows exactly what that veil looked like it was very important and we will learn I promise why that thing is so important um, but the second thing I wanted to show you about this picture is you'll notice the candlestick on the left side the veil is almost on the right side, but the candlestick is on the left side. We're going to go into each one of these, and we'll start with the candlestick, the construction. I'll, I'll play you the video so you can hear the instructions God gave as to what this was made of, how it was made, and what it was supposed to do. And then we're going to go into the significance of it. Make a lampstand of pure hammered gold. The entire lampstand and its decorations will be one piece. The base, center stem, lamp, cups, buds, and blossoms. It will have six branches, three branches going out from each side of the center stem. Each of the six branches will hold a cup shaped like an almond blossom, complete with buds and petals. The center stem of the lampstand will be decorated with four almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. One blossom will be set beneath each pair of branches where they extend from the center stem. The decorations and branches must all be one piece with the stem, and they must be hammered from pure gold. Then make the seven lambs for the lampstand, and set them so they reflect their light forward. The lamp snuffers and trays must also be made of pure gold. You will need 75 pounds of pure gold for the lampstand and its accessories. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. Unlike many of the other pieces of furniture, this was not wood overlaid with gold, but it was solid gold and estimates of its weight range from 75 to 90 pounds. It had one main stem with six branches, three on each side, making a total of seven candles. 
There were no candles of wax, but the tops of each branch as well as the stem were shaped to small bowls that held pure olive oil that would be lit by the priests and burned continually. There were tongs and snuffers made of pure gold to put out the fire when the candlestick was to be transported with the tabernacle. The candlestick represented Christ as the light of the world. It also typified the Holy Spirit as it illuminated or enlightened those who hear and read the word of God. Remember, there were no windows in the tabernacle. The only light in the holy place would come from this candlestick. The lesson here is that anyone who gets understanding of the word of God gets it from divine light, not natural light. True spiritual understanding comes from God, not secular education or your own intelligence. The second item in the holy place was this table of showbread. Listen to the instructions from God concerning this item. Of course, the video may show you this item uh, pictured a little differently than we have it here, but uh, there's many different depictions, so just get used to the differences. Then make a table of acacia wood three feet long, one and a half feet wide, and two and a quarter feet high. Overlay it with pure gold, and run a molding of gold around it. Put a rim about three inches wide around the top edge, and put a gold molding all around the rim. Make four gold rings, and put the rings at the four corners by the four legs, close to the rim around the top. These rings will support the poles used to carry the table. Make these poles from acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And make gold plates and dishes as well as pitchers and bowls to be used in pouring out drink offerings. You must always keep the special bread of the presence on the table before me. Okay, on this table were 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. The priests were supposed to eat this bread every day. This bread represents Jesus as the bread of life. It also typifies the believer eating God's word every day in order to keep their strength. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 8.3, quote, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, unquote. The Bible is our spiritual food and we need to read it every day. An interesting note about this bread is that it was replaced every week, but frankincense was put on the top of each loaf, which probably made this a little bitter. The lesson with the analogy of the bread symbolizing the Word of God is that sometimes the Word of God can be bitter or goes against the desire of our flesh. So our flesh will always find the Word distasteful. This is why many times when you hear the Bible, you don't like it because it goes against your flesh. There's that little bitterness that your flesh doesn't like. The third item in this holy place was the altar of incense, or sometimes known as the golden altar, as opposed to the other altar that was out in the court. That's the brazen altar. This is the golden altar, or the altar of incense. And this was at the back of the holy place, the back of the room, right in front of that veil that separated this room from the most holy place where the high priest is gonna go once a year. Well, this golden altar is very important. There's a lot to be said about this. So first we're gonna learn how it was constructed, what was it, how it was used, and then we're gonna learn about the significance. And there's a lot to learn here. Then make a small altar out of acacia wood for burning incense. It must be 18 inches square and 3 feet high, with horns at the corners carved from the same piece of wood as the altar. Overlay the top, sides, and horns of the altar with pure gold, and run a gold molding around the entire altar. Beneath the molding, on opposite sides of the altar, Attach two gold rings to support the carrying poles. The poles are to be made of acacia wood and overlaid with gold. Place the incense altar just outside the inner curtain 
opposite the Ark's cover, the place of atonement, that rest on the Ark of the Covenant. I will meet with you there. Against the middle back short wall on this rectangular room, or in this rectangular room or compartment, was the altar of incense also known as the Golden Altar. On this altar, the priests were to burn a special incense that was formulated by God for this special purpose, and God commanded that they never use this special formula for anything or anyone else. Incense in scripture usually typifies prayers and obedience to God. The fire was always to burn on this altar, but twice a day it was to be specially attended to and renewed by the priest. The golden altar was the most central piece of furniture in the holy place. This golden altar differed from the brazen altar outside in the courtyard in two main ways. Number one, the function, purpose, or picture of the brazen altar out in the courtyard was death, typifying Christ's suffering and death for our sins, dealing with our need for redemption and reconciliation. The function, purpose, or picture of the golden altar in the holy place with its incense was an altar of eternal life, typifying Christ after his resurrection and ascension into heaven, ever living to make intercession for the redeemed. Okay, so that was the one difference between the two altars. The second important way that the two altars are different is their location. Now this is really important because we had talked about this earlier. Whereas the brazen altar was located outside in the courtyard of the tabernacle, which represented Christ on earth, before his resurrection and ascension into heaven, the golden altar was located in the holy place, which represented Christ in heaven at the right hand of God after his resurrection and ascension. Keep in mind, the golden altar was the closest piece of furniture to the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, which of course represented the presence of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, it says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. As already described, this altar, like everything else in the tabernacle structure itself, was either pure gold or overlaid with gold because gold represents deity and we are now in the presence of God. You know, you're part of God's family now. You're inside the tabernacle which represents being in the family of God. So there is no brass or bronze within the sanctuary. Okay, As the incense is a sweet smell to God or pleasing to God, it represented the life of Christ who said, quote, I always do those things that please him, talking about God. Okay. Unquote. All right. well, there were places in the gospel where it was recorded that a voice from heaven actually said, quote, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Unquote. So the incense represents the life of Jesus Christ, which pleased the Father. The second point that is to be made of incense is that it represents prayers and intercessions. And in this case, that aspect first typified Christ because in the book of Hebrews, it states twice that Jesus liveth ever to make intercession for us in heaven. The twofold typology continues with the believer in that the Holy Spirit causes the believer's prayers and intercessions to be very pleasing and precious to God. The other thing about this incense is the ingredients and the process that went into making it. It was not just composed of frankincense, there were other ingredients, all of which had to be crushed or ground up into a powder and then, of course, burned. The process typified Christ's sacrificial life, humbling himself, going through testing 
trials, temptations, beatings, and being obedient unto death. Whereas the process was unpleasant, the product was like the incense, very pleasing to God. The next very important point to be made is why and how this altar of incense works and typifies our salvation. In order to fully understand this point, you must first get a general knowledge about the procedure of the sacrificial system. God commanded that there was to be made some very important distinctions between the brazen altar in the courtyard and the altar of incense in the tabernacle. One of these distinctions is that there was never to be any sacrifice offered on the altar of incense inside the tabernacle. Yet, when the sin offering, which was a goat, was offered on the brazen altar out in the courtyard, the priest was to take some of the blood of that sin offering and sprinkle it seven times on the horns of the altar of incense inside the tabernacle. The significance is very important. Although the incense represents Christ interceding for us in heaven, he can only intercede based on his blood on Calvary. Without his shed blood, Christ would not be able to successfully intercede for us because it was the blood that tells that the price for sin had been paid. That is the basis of his intercession. He basically says, and I'm paraphrasing it, I paid for their sins. Here's the proof. Here is my blood. As touching the seven times, the number seven in the Bible speaks of completeness and perfection. When Christ died on the cross, one of the last things he said was, it is finished. He completed the work. No one else had to do anything more. No one else needs to intercede for us. He does it perfectly. Now to have faith in Christ is to have faith in what he's doing and what he's done. Any religion or anyone that makes anyone feel like they need someone else to intercede for them or they need someone else's help in terms of getting right with God beyond what Jesus did is actually preaching against the plan of salvation. They're preaching against Christ. They're preaching against the work of Christ. They are insulting God. Remember, in part one of this presentation, we had talked about the plan of salvation, and we said that this whole thing was designed by God, and it was all based on love. His love for you caused him to do this for you. And now, it's like you're telling God, because you're going to someone else to intercede for you, that you don't trust him. That's like a kid going to a total stranger instead of his own father to ask for help. How do you think that makes God feel? Remember, when you're in this tabernacle, it typified being in God. It typified being born again. When you're born again, you are actually a priest. You now have access to God because you're made right with God. You took care of all of the penalty through Christ at the brazen altar and the baptism out in the courtyard, and now you're in the family of God. So you have the right to pray, and you trust Jesus to intercede for you, to make uh, intercession for you and help you on your journey while you live here in this life. Um, we're now getting ready to move into the next room, which is the most holy place, which is where the high priest goes once a year. And in order to do that, we have to pass this veil and we have to talk about this veil. And the next section, the next part of this presentation will be the veil and it's extremely important so I know you're going to try to watch the next part, part four. See you next time. Bye-bye.